Hi friends, here's your week seven read aloud, Rock Suboxone by Alice McLaren and illustrated by Barbara Cooney. Marion called it Rock Suboxone. She always knew the name of everything. There across the road, it looked like any rocky hill. Nothing but sand and rocks, some old wooden boxes, cactuses and greasewood and thorny ocotillo, but it was a special place. The street between Roxaboxen and the houses curved like a river, so Marion named it the River Road. After that, you had to ford a river to reach Roxaboxen. Ford means you had to cross the river. Of course, all of Marion's sisters came, Anna May and Francis and little Jean, Charles from next door, even though he was 12. Oh, and Eleanor naturally, and Jamie with his brother Paul. Later on, there were others, but these were the first. Well, not really the first. Roxaboxen had always been there and must have belonged to others long before. When Marion dug up a tin box filled with round black pebbles, everyone knew what it was. It was buried treasure. Those pebbles were the money of Roxaboxen. You could still find others like them if you looked hard enough. But some days became treasure hunting days, with everybody trying to find that special kind. And then, on other days, you might just find one without even looking. A town of rocks of oxen began to grow, traced in lines of stone. Main Street first, edged with the whitest ones, and then the houses. Charles made his of the biggest stones. After all, he was the oldest. At first, the houses were very plain, but soon they all began to add more rooms. The old wooden boxes could be shelves or tables or anything you wanted. You could find pieces of pottery for dishes, Round pieces were best. Look at that, they're playing into the, into the sunset. This is almost nighttime. Later on, there was a town hall. Marion was mayor, of course. That was just the way she was. Nobody minded. After a while, they added other streets. Frances moved to one of them and built herself a new house outlined in desert glass, bits of amber, amethyst, and sea green, a house of jewels. Amber is this sort of brown color. Amethyst is this sort of blue color. I think she's calling this one sea green. It's funny how the desert in this book almost looks a little bit like the ocean. The illustrator chose some pretty careful colors. And because everybody had plenty of money, there were plenty of shops. Jean helped Anna May in the bakery. Pies and cakes and bread baked warm in the sun. There were two ice cream parlors. Was Paul's ice cream the best or Eleanor's? Everybody kept trying them both. In Roxaboxen, you can eat all the ice cream you want. Why does the author say you can eat all the ice cream you want? Take a look. Huh. Everybody had a car. All you needed was something round for a steering wheel. Of course, if you broke the speed limit, you had to go to jail. The jail had cactus on the floor to make it uncomfortable, and Jamie was the policeman. Anna May, quite little Anna May, was always speeding. You'd think she liked to go to jail. Can you see Anna May in this picture? I wonder which one she might be. How can you tell? I think I see her. She's here in jail. But ah, if you had a horse, you could go as fast as the wind. There were no speed limits for horses and you didn't have to stay on the roads. All you needed for a horse was a stick 
in some kind of bridle, and you could gallop anywhere. The bridle is this part that looks kind of like a, a rope. Helps you hold on to the horse. Sometimes there were wars. Once there was a great war, boys against girls. Charles and Marion were the generals. The girls had Fort Irene, and they were all Girl Scouts. The boys made a fort at the other end of Roxaboxen, and they were all bandits. Bandits are like robbers. Oh, the raids were fierce, loud with whooping and the stamping of horses. The whirling swords of Akatito had sharp thorns. But when you reached your fort, you were safe. Roxaboxen had a cemetery in case anyone died but the only grave in it was for a dead lizard. Each year when the cactus bloomed, they decorated the grave with flowers. Hmm. I didn't know that about cactus, that they had flowers on them until I read this book. Sometimes in winter, when everybody was at school and the weather was bad and no one went to Roxaboxen at all, not for weeks and weeks, but it didn't matter. Roxaboxen was always waiting. Roxaboxen was always there. And spring came and the Ocotillo blossomed and everybody sucked the honey from its flowers and everybody built new rooms and everybody decided to have jeweled windows. That summer there were three new houses on the east slope and two new shops on Main Street. And so it went. The seasons changed and the years went by. Roxaboxen was always there. The years went by and the seasons changed, and until at last the friends had all grown tall, and one by one they moved away to other houses, to other towns. So you might think that was the end of Roxaboxen, but oh no. Because no one, none of them ever forgot Roxaboxen. Not one of them ever forgot. Years later, Marion's children listened to stories of that place and fell asleep dreaming dreams of Roxaboxen. Gray-haired Charles picked up a black pebble on the beach and stood holding it, remembering Roxaboxen. More than 50 years later, Francis went back and Roxaboxen was still there. She could see the white stones bordering Main Street and there where she had built her house of desert glass that still glowed amethyst, amber, and sea green. There she is, all grown up. You can just see the outline of those white rocks. There's a note from the author in the back. It says, on a hill in the southeast corner of 2nd Avenue and 8th Street in Yuma, Arizona, there is a place once known as Roxaboxen. The events in this book really happened to Alice McLaren's mother. Alice McLaren is the author. With the aid of her mother's childhood manuscript and the memories of relatives and letters and maps from the former inhabitants of Roxaboxen, Alice McLaren was able to recreate that magical world as if she had played there herself. She presents us with a celebration of the active imagination, of the ability of children to create, even with the most unpromising materials, a world of fantasy so real and multidimensional that it earns a lasting place in memory. It's a real place. Alice McLaren's mother played there when she was a little girl. And they used things that they found that were nearby them to build that imaginary town. You've been doing that. You do it in dramatic play and you do it in beautiful stuff. You do it in the blocks area. You're going to get to do some more of that this week, and we'll talk about it when we have our read aloud together on Wednesday. If you have rocks of boxen at home, read it on your own. Look around your house and see what you can imagine with this week. I'll see you on Wednesday.